technology lined up here. All right, so today's topic is liquid analyzers part C, ILM 310304DC. Uh, and we're looking at the uh, last couple of liquid analyzers today. So we're going to look at turbidity analyzers and dissolved oxygen analyzers. So uh, turbidity is new. Everything about turbidity is new to us, but dissolved oxygen. Uh, same kind of science as we talked about with uh, oxygen analyzers when we were discussing them in gas analyzer section. Uh, so not too much difference uh, science-wise between the two of them. So uh, should be a pretty good uh, ILM for us here today. So our objectives today, uh, principle of analysis and application of turbidity analyzers and turbidity analyzers. Uh, for those of you who have never heard of them before, um, measure the haziness of water. So they're a, a pretty important water quality analyzer. Um, operation of turbidity analyzers, and then for the same thing for dissolved oxygen analyzers. So this module explains turbidity and dissolved oxygen analyzers, and both of these are very important water quality parameters, and uh, specifically water quality like drinking water. Uh, for example, and also uh, wastewater. So that type of water quality is what we're talking about. So turbidity, right off the bat here by definition, refers to the number of suspended solids in a liquid. Uh, and in layman's terms, it's the measure of the haziness of water. So it's made with tiny particles that you can't see with the naked eye. Um, and the science behind most of the analyzers that we're going to look at uh, involves some form of light. And when the light hits this, it scatters uh, and it makes that fluid appear hazy. At the same time, we can, we can detect that scattered light with some uh, optical uh, detectors. So here's some common examples of, of what turbidity looks like. So very turbid water, a lot less turbid water, of course. Uh, we aim for nice clear water most of the time. And this is why we measure uh, for turbidity. Uh, you'll see uh, four or five different types of analyzers that we're going to talk about, uh, all with the same kind of basic science, but little twists on them, uh, usually as, as they are to uh, address specific uh, complications that you might have with just one generic device. Okay, so turbidity analyzers here measure the amount of scattered light through or off of the sample, and that's really the distinction that either measures the light that actually makes it through or some reflective form of that light, and thus we call this an optical technique. In this diagram here, you can see that relative to our light source, the analyzer can detect the beam in several ways. Uh, this is how we distinguish between the different types of turbidity analyzers um, and we'll name them um, well i guess some of them actually have names and some of them are just described by the way that they are orientated as we as we see here so uh, you'll see we have uh, light that is detected at a 90 degree angle from its source we have light that is measured as it is transmitted uh, across or through the source uh, we have some that are uh, away or forward from the source so you see it kind of a 45 degree angle here, and we also have some that reflect back towards the source, towards the detector. So um, lots of different ways to measure this light, and you'll see as we discuss these individually what the pros and cons are of uh, the different orientations here. So there, uh, when we're measuring for turbidity, uh, there's a lot of different turbidity standards out there. Um, Generally speaking, the one that we use is determined by the material that the standard is made of or the scale that is required to be used uh, by a particular analyzer, and the analyzer will uh, identify that for you. Um, this chart, uh, kind of uh, evolutionary, again, uh, the three main turbidity units that we uh, we discussed in the ILM, uh, first one is called the Jackson uh, turbidity unit. Um, it's used by making 
a solution uh, made out of some purified clay, and it measures measurement that is transmitted or goes through. And you'll see the, the science behind this is very, very primitive, uh, but yet effective. Uh, and then future technologies kind of build, build on this, still using light, uh, but generally just different uh, materials in the type of standard. So the second one is called a formazin turbidity unit uh, because it is made out of a formazin polymer and it can be used for all types of uh, turbidimeters. Uh, the last one here is nephilometric turbidity units, uh, NTUs. This is the one that we talk about mostly and I'm not an uh, absolute turbidity guru, but I'm going to say that probably this is most common. Um, using formazin or plastic polymer beads as a standard, and this is the one that works uh, scattered at 90 degrees uh, specifically. Uh, and you'll see as we talk about the individual devices, what units are kind of attached to them. Okay, so here's here's a look at that uh, Jackson turbidity unit, and it's a transmissive type device, meaning the light source is down here at the bottom. And basically, all you're doing is you're looking down uh, the center of this container. Uh, as you add the fluid to it and at some point in time you're not going to be able to see the candle anymore and they call that the the reading so kind of primitive uh, the second one uh, formazin units here are based on formazin which we again said was a polymer uh, and it's a standard used for all types of meters and the last one, the nephilometric, I guess, and I'm not sure if that's a word, uh, same values generated as the FTU does, but this works again specifically on that 90 degree scattered method of measurement. So kind of two slides in a row on the same thing. Um, that's kind of a, a important focus, I guess, in this ILM. Okay, so there's several, several types of turbinometers, as I said, and they are categorized by the scatter angle uh, of the light or the number of light detectors. And these are the ones uh, that we're going to be talking about, uh, named based on that orientation again. So uh, the 90 degree scattered one is called the nephilometer. Uh, the transmission meter is 180 degrees, meaning the light goes straight through the sample. Uh, a ratio turbidimeter uh, can have both a combination of different methods. Um, with many different sensors, and we'll talk about the specific benefits of, of these as we move forward here. And the last one is called a surface scatter turbidimeter, and this one is back scattered, uh, and it's the only one uh, that's actually non contact. So you see it has a very specific application. Lighting for most of these uh, devices nowadays is probably LED, um, but historically, tungsten bulbs have been used in, in the past. So here's the nephilometer. Again, nephilometry is the 90 degree uh, scattered light. So the light uh, it hits the bodies in the fluid and are scattered. And the light that is scattered at a 90 degree angle uh, sends that light to the detector and the detector picks it up and some fancy math is done and we can get our uh, reading from it. Um, yeah, perfect. To me, it doesn't make sense, it seems to, uh, I say counterintuitive because you don't think about measuring the light that's reflected. I always think about measuring the light that you don't see, but that's just me. Okay, uh, next here, uh, more little details about, about this light uh, and some of the problems that you can see uh, coming into play, bubbles in particular reflecting light, and uh, that's bad for not just this detector, but most detectors. Um, bubbles come out of fluids as uh, the fluid warms up in the ILM. It talks about uh, leaving a, a glass of cool water uh, on your kitchen counter and after uh, a period of time you'll start seeing bubbles come out of it. Um, that's oxygen actually leaving uh, the water. Uh, it was dissolved oxygen at a certain temperature and as it warms up those bubbles uh, will come out. They'll also come out if the atmospheric pressure uh, decreases uh, and allows the liquid to form bubbles. So bubbles are problematic uh, for the sensors. And if you run into a situation like that, you'll have to throw in a device called a, a debubbler. Uh, and of course, the debubbler does exactly what it, uh, what it says. It uh, gets the bubbles out of there. So this is kind of a drawing out of the ILM that shows the debubbled water. Um, so some specifics about the nephilometer here. Uh, poor, poor accuracy at high turbidity levels. So not good for really thick, dirty stuff. Uh, 
lamp aging, that's going to be common uh, between all the different technologies. The lamps will age. Uh, bubbles on the sensor will affect readings. Again, that will be common between most of these devices. And colored liquids are problematic. And you'll see moving forward that one of these devices uh, is well suited for colored liquids. Another device is well suited for high turbidity levels. So uh, there is actually a table that kind of puts the applications uh, all on one page. Second type here is a transmissiometer, uh, and this detects the light remaining or transmitted or that gets through, not reflected. So this is a little bit different uh, than the other three in terms of technology. Uh, they tend to use some type of a reflected angle forwards, backwards, 90 degrees. Uh, this one is the light that, that makes it through. To me, this is one that uh, somehow makes more sense for me. Uh, these are better at high turbidities. They're not very good for low values. Uh, and a good general mid-range uh, device. Next one here is the ratio turbidimeter, which uses a combination of different uh, orientations here and multiple sensors to compensate for things like bulb aging, uh, color absorption, things like that. Uh, because it uses a, a multitude of different angles, it tends to be more representative. Uh, and the ratio uh, orientation or configuration reduces lamp aging and color effects. And there's a little bit more to it than, than I've stated here. Um, but it averages out, uh, you know, average lamp power and, and things like that. So it uh, gives you a more reliable uh, measurement. Last but not least, um, one of the more common ones in the water and wastewater uh, industry, uh, I know this from experience, I've seen these uh, these are very, very popular at the clean water plant here in uh, Red Deer. Um, we had a few of them also at the dirty water plant here in Red Deer. So these are uh, fairly common uh, and unique in the fact that these are the only ones so far that are non-contact. <clears throat> so the science behind this, uh, as you see here, the light is uh, shot out and is reflected off a smooth surface. And uh, it's kind of a fast loop bypass situation. So there's always kind of a meniscus up here uh, that's continuously circulating. So it gets a, a pretty good representative sample. Very good for high turbidities um, because there's no contact. Uh, so it won't get dirty or uh, have any issues with coating and things like that. These will measure in uh, NTU or FTU units. And again, uh, non-contact. So. Um, a pretty common device from my experience anyway. All right, moving into some, a uh, little bit of science here, I guess. Um, the light absorbed or reflected off of the particles in the, in the fluid is a function of the number of the particles and their size, their shape, and their color. So when we're measuring it and uh, we're dealing with the number of particles, we talk about it's the concentration of these solids, uh, usually measured in milligrams per liter, or parts per million. Uh, you may have heard the term uh, total suspended solids. Um, I think if you look on your bottled water, if you were buying bottled water and you looked on your label, uh, there would be a measurement there that deals with this concentration of particles uh, and they would call it uh, total su suspended solids. And you'll see, hopefully it's a very small number because uh, bottled water is uh, very processed. Okay, so there's no actual direct relationship between the turbidity numbers and concentrations. Um, a person can, can correlate the different uh, units to two concentrations by recording data in a table. This is all according to the ILM. Uh, and this table can then be used to indicate the total suspended solids based on turbidity measurements. So it's kind of a graphy, plotty kind of uh, thing, but basically uh, the way it works is you find your numbers uh, that make you happy and you plot them on a graph and that's kind of what you go by. All right, applications. So we know that this is a water quality analyzer, so it's going to be uh, water applications. So first one that we look at here is a potable water treatment uh, application. Um, we know that raw water coming in from the river generally contains large amounts of suspended solids, especially in this time runoff. Uh, if our drinking water is cloudy, obviously we don't like it. And by measuring turbidity, uh, we can we can make better water, uh, better water quality 
and make sure that we meet the standards, not just for the consumers, um, but for uh, the government. So here's we have uh, here we have a basic uh, line diagram of a uh, water treatment facility showing you uh, where you would have turbidity analyzers and which different technologies uh, are more useful in different areas. Right, some of them work better with high turbidities, some of them are mid-range uh, uh, machines, and some of them are better for low turbidities. So uh, good opportunity here for a bunch of different test questions as far as applications go. So water comes into the plant, of course, uh, pretty thick uh, at this point in time with lots of particles in it here. Um, then it goes through a clarifier at this point here. Uh, a lot of the solid particles start to drop out. Cleaner water overflows the clarifier. They'll measure it again. Then there's a gravity filter, of course, collecting particles. Uh, against the filter, the filter backwash is going to have a pretty high concentration uh, of particles. Um, but as it comes out of the gravity filter, it should be even cleaner than it was yet at the clarifier. So uh, less concentration here. Um, finally goes to a, a final settling tank and then finally off to the distribution network, which should have uh, the lowest turbidity. So uh, if we looked at the uh, applications or the abilities of the different meters here uh, listed from the lowest range to the highest range. So we have the methylometer, transmission meter, ratio, and surface scatter. You can kind of think through this, which ones would you use where, right? There's not much particles as it's getting ready to go to the distribution network, so methylometer probably works there. Uh, lots of particles coming in, uh, so you'd probably use a surface scatter uh, on something like that. Uh, if you were dealing with colors or something like that, uh, and you can verify this as you read the ILM. Maybe ratio is your uh, the, the machine that you're that you're looking for. So different technologies fit in different different spots. Okay, second application is food and beverage industry. I guess it's actually uh, I think it's the third. I don't know if I combined water and wastewater in the same one or not. But at any rate, uh, yeah, food and beverage. So uh, used for beer, wine, and soft drinks, of course, among uh, other products uh, to ensure that uh, in beer, at least, they don't contain yeast and other solids unless you're um, a hipster and you like your IPAs with a little bit of uh, protein at the bottom. Uh, ratio meters used for wine because the color absorption throws off other types of meters. So uh, there's a nice little question there, I would say. Uh, very specific application. Uh, mentioned here for colored fluids. So that's the applications of the meters here. So water and wastewater were in fact combined there. Uh, objective two, uh, describing the operation of turbidity analyzers. So this is pretty short and pretty sweet. Uh, this encompasses pages 12 to 17 here. So um, biggest concerns uh, of course are bulb strength and bulb bulb aging, so that's one of the maintenance uh, practices. Most modern transmitters uh, nowadays will have indicators, uh, kind of like slope indicators that tell you uh, the strength of your bulb compared to uh, what it was when it was new. Uh, second concern uh, we talked about earlier, uh, bubbles on the sensor face, and the third concern, uh, non-representative samples. So again, with uh, anything that's suspended, uh, solids, for example, in a liquid, uh, you want to make sure it's well mixed uh, uh, in order to get a good representative sample. Okay, installation. Oh, there's something else I want to say. Let me think here. Uh, concerns, non representative uh, non representative samples. I'm, I'm just going to talk really quickly about this one more time because uh, I'm not sure if I got a slide on this coming up or not. Uh, Probe selection, I think there is a section on, on that, but nonetheless, uh, generally side taps um, for uh, sus suspended solid type applications. You don't want anything in the bottom that'll plug. You don't want anything on the top because you want the solids out there. So generally a side tap uh, center of the pipe, of course, gets you the best sample in terms of representation. Installation here, uh, specifically referring to debubbling one more time here. Bubbles reflect light, so we remove them using a debugger device with some kind of baffle system built into it. Uh, another way we can help mitigate bubbles is 
uh, by putting some type of a restriction after the sensor. Uh, that, that way, the pressure reduction, uh, if we had it before, we would have a pressure reduction and that causes like an aerosol effect, uh, introducing bubbles. So if we do our flow control or pressure control after the sensor, uh, we don't get those bubbles. Uh, there's a little point I made about side taps uh, and center of the pipe again there. Calibration, page 14, three, uh, three concerns that are addressed in the ILM here. So two different styles of calibration. So uh, reference method, we've talked about this, lots of different devices use a reference uh, method where we take a sample and we go to the lab and we compare it against another uh, instrument and hopefully the numbers jive, otherwise we do uh, calibration on it. Uh, that would be the standard method where we'll use a standard of a known value, whether it's clay or formazin uh, or whatever the standard is for our device, and we'll calibrate to that standard. Uh, small section in the ILM that talks about making a diluted standard. So you have uh, some kind of a generic standard on the shelf, however many parts PM, PPMs or NTUs or FTUs it might, might be, and you need to make uh, some type of a diluted standard. So there's a small exercise in the ILM um, where we have a standard solution on the shelf of 4,000 uh, NTUs and we need to get, uh, we need to make uh, some other kind of a solution, uh, 1,000 milliliters of 20 NTUs is what we need to make. So this is the exercise uh, that we have to get. So we have to, uh, it's pretty simple math. What do we need versus what do we have uh, times 1,000 uh, milliliters because that's what we want. Uh, it tells us that we need to make uh, take five milliliters of our shelf product, add it to 995 milliliters of uh, deionized water, and we have our uh, solution that we uh, require. It goes on to explain beyond that that we can't just say uh, water uh, added to our solution is going to make what we need because even pure water has some turbidity. Uh, if you looked at the bottled water example again, uh, there is a number on the side of it. It's a small number, but there is a number. Uh, so we add that value to the overall turbidity. So in the example in the ILM, um, deionized water has a turbidity of about 0.08 NTUs. So thus our sample that we actually made would be 20.08 NTUs. Uh, so just some good understanding there uh, if you ever do find yourself in the situation where you're making a standard. Okay, there is also something new uh, I found in this new version of the ILM that's uh, called dry check standards. Um, these are a bump test or a reference sort of method of verification. Uh, and what came to mind when I read this section here is they're kind of like the small plates that you use for uh, UV fire, fire detection, uh, you know, they're uh, uh, you just you hold them up in front of uh, the light there and they have different uh, scales of uh, darkness or filtering uh, that represent different concentrations uh, for whatever unit it is that you happen to be uh, using here. So you can see this application where it's kind of a plate that's used to represent some type of a concentration. So that's kind of neat. Uh, maintenance, page 17 here. Maintenance is limited basically to two functions, uh, cleaning sensor and housing, making sure that we don't have buildup uh, or anything there, uh, which would cause uh, sensor drift, uh, specifically a zero drift. Um, make sure you follow the instructions of the manufacturer in terms of what kinds of solutions that you use, uh, abrasives, et cetera. Um, some of them will have uh, automatic washers, spray jets, and things like that, uh, but again, varies by manufacturer. And then, uh, uh, other process that you may be required to do is changing bulbs uh, and light sources. And again, uh, usually the electronics nowadays will let you know as your bulb uh, ages um, and they will need to be replaced. So that's kind of turbidity. Um, next uh, section in the ILM here, dissolved oxygen. Um, fairly uh, similar, as I said earlier, to the oxygen measurements we talked about. Um, when we're talking about gas analyzers, except there is no heat involved because we're looking at this basically in a uh, water application. Okay, uh, dissolved oxygen 
dissolved oxygen analyzers measures the amount of oxygen dissolved in water. And typically you don't see it, but it's in there because uh, we know it's in there because fish and plants live in water and they don't die. So uh, again, here's that example that uh, you can use to prove that there's oxygen in, in water. Uh, you leave a glass of water on the counter and you notice after a little while, uh, you'll get some bubbles on the side of the glass and that is the oxygen coming out of the water. Uh, water will hold about eight milligrams uh, of oxygen per liter um, at 25 degrees Celsius. It will hold about 13 milligrams at four degrees Celsius. So as the water gets colder, it holds more oxygen and that reinforces the theory that as it warms up, the oxygen comes out of it and you see those bubbles. Um, the amount that uh, water can hold also depends on air pressure. Again, air pressure squishes the bubbles and keeps it in the water. Uh, and also the amount of dissolved salts in the sample. Uh, and there's a little blurb in there that talks specifically about uh, dissolved salt, salts and they're basically uh, in layman's terms an, an oxygen consumer. Uh, so uh, fresh water holds more oxygen than salt water is really the takeaway from that. Okay, so all of this uh, dissolved oxygen is really soluble, right? Remember, we're saying that the oxygen is soluble in water. So oxygen solubility increases with pressure. Oxygen solubility decreases with the amount of dissolved salts. Fresh water, again, holding more oxygen than salt water. Oxygen, as we know, is essential for not just aquatic life, um, but our life too. That's why we measure it in gases, why we measure it in liquids. Uh, oxygen in feed water, uh, boiler feed water specifically, uh, causes rust and corrosion. That's why we measure uh, for dissolved oxygen in boiler feed water applications uh, and why we use de-aerators de to remove uh, that oxygen from feed waters. Uh, uses uh, for dissolved oxygen, we measure for adequate oxygen to support life in the water systems. Uh, I know in the wastewater treatment plant, for example, uh, one of the very last batches of measurements uh, as it leaves the, the building to go to the river, they measure the pH and they measure the oxygen like right the la very last thing before it leaves the building, they measure this because it is very important if we put deox uh, deoxygenated water into the river, things in the river are going to start to die and that doesn't look good. Uh, you don't want to have too much, otherwise you get too much bacteria growth. Uh, this is all uh, regulated, of course, by the government. Then we have to uh, maintain uh, government standards and regulations, of course. Uh, measuring the oxygen, again, boiler feed water, uh, so that we don't get rusting and scaling and corrosion of our piping systems. Units for uh, dissolved oxygen, uh, milligrams per liter, parts PM, um, and percent saturation are all common, uh, are all common units. Um, if you remember back from a couple of ILMs ago in chemistry, we talked about uh, solution concentrations and we had milligrams per liter. And again, a uh, good one to remember, one milligram in a liter is equal to a part per, part per million. This is a very good conversion to remember. So we just think of it this way, this is a thousandth of a gram, so you're going decimal places one way. This is a thousand um, milliliters and that's going decimal places the other way and the difference between the two of them is six decimal places. So a uh, good conversion to remember, probably the best conversion to remember in terms of uh, liquid measurements is one milligram in a liter is equal to a ppm. Anyway, these are the three units for dissolved oxygen. Uh, the last one percent saturation here is temperature de dependent and it is uh, dependent on the amount of oxygen uh, that water can hold at a given temperature and it comes with a fancy little formula. As we see here, percent saturation is the actual amount of oxygen that we have compared to the maximum amount of oxygen that water could hold at a given temperature. If you think back to the moisture and humidity measurements, uh, we had a similar thing um, with moisture in the air relative humidity, if you recall, um, very similar formula here. Uh, I do not believe there's any uh, examples or requirements for us to do any of this uh, math, but good to know. 
Uh, let's see here. Okay, getting into the device itself now. Uh, dissolved oxygen analyzers use electrochemical sensors to measure the concentration in both gases and vapor phases or in liquid streams. Uh, the only difference that you're going to see here technology-wise when we look at these sensors here is we don't talk about uh, the zirconium oxide one uh, in liquids. Uh, because of course it's uh, it's heated to 600 degrees and it wouldn't do that very well if it was wet. Uh, so we don't talk about that one anymore, but we do talk about uh, electrochemical cells, the same ones that we talked about in gas analyzers here. So uh, specifically they are the polar graphic uh, and galvanic cells uh, that we talked about in the ILM, but I've also thrown in uh, option three here, uh, an optical style dissolved uh, oxygen analyzer and there's nothing in the ILM about this but I will talk about it because uh, this is becoming more and more popular and they're uh, just so much better than both of these other ones in my opinion anyway and I'll tell you why when we get to that section. Okay so a little bit about these sensors uh, again you should be noticing at this point in the course that when we're looking at these liquid analyzers and their sensors they are very similar in construction. They've got an anode, they've got a cathode, they've got a membrane, they've got some kind of a fill fluid, um, and they're all pretty much uh, they're all pretty much the same in the in the way that they are constructed. But there are unique differences, of course, between all of them. Okay, so the first one we talk is a polar graphic cell. Uh, this type of cell is typically a uh, silver anode and another noble metal so such as gold uh, there's uh, gold is a noble metal silver i think titanium is another one there's a few of them um, but when we say noble metal think expensive metal um, kcl for an electrolyte uh, and then some kind of a membrane you'll see here teflon membrane uh, silver anode in this case here as a, as a noble metal gold cathode uh, I remember from when I was in trade school many, many, many years ago, there were a bunch of test questions on what type of anodes and cathodes are in what type of cells. So good to uh, good to know. Okay, so uh, polar graphic, uh, some other unique things here, specific polar graphic uh, is polarized at 800 millivolts. So you'll see here it's actually uh, being supplied a voltage. We're feeding it 800 millivolts by an external power source. <clears throat> it creates an electron flow uh, that's created by the interaction between uh, oxygen and the cathode and the electrode and you get a ion flow going through these things and uh, of course a big circuit of uh, electricity going around there. So that's a polar graphic cell. The uh, oh, there's, here's a polar graphic cell, I guess, more realistic view uh, where we wrap everything into uh, one housing, which is typical of their construction. So again, silver anode, KCL fill fluid, uh, oxygen permeable membrane, meaning the oxygen can get through, but hopefully nothing else. Uh, Teflon from the previous example, gold cathode, and looky looky, temperature compensation built in here, all these measurements go to the transmitter that does the goods for us here. Problems that we can have with these type of sensors, and you should see some commonalities uh, again uh, between these sensors. Anode isolation we've heard before, or coating, which is a uh, common uh, PM to clean that anode, anode with an abrasive. And be careful when you hear abrasive, we're not talking about sandpaper typically, we're talking about, you know, a uh, cotton cloth or a co uh, paper or towel or something. Uh, nothing too crazy, make sure you don't go nuts. Uh, electrolyte depletion, uh, another problem with these type of cells, again, that's filled up with fluid and it could disappear, causing a zero shift. Um, common PM, used to be a common PM uh, to refill the fluid uh, in these. Nowadays, we're kind of more of a throwaway society and if the cell goes bad, we just throw it out. But there used to be a, uh, a day when uh, you would keep fill fluid on the shelf uh, and you would refill these yourself. Uh, these polar graphic cells have a warm up time of about 10 minutes. Uh, some people would consider that to be a, a disadvantage or a limitation. 
uh, operating range here. Uh, pay attention to this number because the, uh, the next one we talk about is significantly different. Uh, zero to 20 parts per million range for the polar graphic cell. Okay, here is a galvanic cell. Uh, Construction-wise, we'll address first here. Very, very similar, as you can see, physically the same. Okay, gold cathode, same. Permeable membrane, same. Temperature compensation, same. Anode, lead, zinc, or copper, not noble metals. Okay, so these are cheaper metals, if you will, uh, but not noble metals. Fill fluid, uh, potassium hydroxide here versus uh, potassium chloride, which was in the previous example. So little differences between them. Otherwise, pretty much the same. Uh, operation, one significant difference. Uh, Self-polarizing, first of all, which means it has no external polarizing voltage required. So you may see that as an advantage. Uh, no warm-up time, you may see that as an advantage. Uh, and again, you'll see the KO, KOH electrolyte is different than the KCL. Um, was there something else I was going to mention here? No, uh, that's it really. So basically the difference between the two of them, and the ILM used to go into this a little bit more uh, deeply, but a galvanic cell is essentially uh, a battery. Uh, it, re, it relies on a, a chemical reaction, uh, the, which causes ions to flow here, and it generates uh, its own flow. That's why there's no external voltage required. So one requires voltage, one makes its own, basically. Uh, a galvanic cell is sometimes called a corrosion cell, which is essentially a battery. Okay, benefits. Uh, generates its own power. Uh, no warm-up time. Uh, here's the units. I was saying significant difference here. 0 to 20 parts per billion versus parts per million. Uh, limitations. Process temperature. Uh, this, is, uh, this is why we don't use this type of cells generally for uh, uh, furnaces and gas measurement uh, and why we use these for liquids and why we don't use polar or why we don't use zirconium oxide for liquids and for gases. Um, if the process temperature is too low for these types of cells, of course, they will freeze. And if it's too hot, like it would be in a gas analyzer application, it would boil off and or damage that membrane. So the operating range for the polar graphic and the galvanic cells is usually between zero and 50 degrees Celsius. So these ones are used on liquids. Uh, there's zirconium oxide, one is typically used on gases. Okay, the cells have a shelf life, uh, meaning they're, they're working even when they're just sitting on the shelf. Um, so after a certain period of time, even new ones on the shelf can be uh, bad. So you'll uh, have to be aware of that fact. <clears throat> Must be temperature compensated in order to address the permeation rate. Um, I can't remember if we've talked about permeation tubes before. Same science behind a permeation tube. A permeation tube is a Teflon tube filled with a concentration of uh, some gas uh, or liquid that uh, when kept at a certain temperature allows it out at a certain uh, reliable rate. Uh, so same science here. Uh, and as you saw in the uh, images of the probes, they are in fact temperature compensated. So good for us. Um, these cells can be contaminated from uh, other gases, uh, i.e. things that were not intended to, to measure. So for example, if you've got sour water, uh, you could be contaminating your, your cells with uh, uh, H2S. Okay, here's the one I was telling you about that uh, I never, uh, is not in the ILM, but it's uh, an optical probe. Um, we had the, um, polar graphic or galvanic cells, I can't remember which one they were actually at the uh, water treatment plant. And they were a high maintenance item. They were right in the process. They were right in that dirty water. Uh, and they were a high maintenance item. There was always, always one of them uh, going down and there were about 12 of them. So it, it made up a good portion of our work. 
um, we had a sales guy come by and he, he said, oh, we got these new optical ones. They use an LED. Uh, they're really good. You should try one. So uh, I bought a couple, installed them, and they were amazing. Uh, the PMs went down from looking at, uh, or maintenance went down from looking at one of them every week to basically going out every month just to make sure that they were still hanging on the end, end of the uh, end of the uh, buoyant, the, they're on the little buoys, uh, still hanging on the end of the rods because uh, there was no problems with them uh, whatsoever. They were just such an improvement. Uh, but anyway, you'll see these are kind of like a refractory kind of light uh, kind of science technology. But uh, if you're in the, in the market, they're definitely worth looking for. I don't own shares, um, but I, I, really, I really found them to be awesome. All right, applications for dissolved oxygen wastewater treatment uh, used to monitor oxygen depleting organisms before water is released into rivers as well. Um, and I didn't include this in the ILM, and I guess I should probably edit it. Um, part of the wastewater treatment uh, process is having biological uh, organisms eat your poop, uh, to put it bluntly. Um, in order for those organisms to live, the poop water has to be oxygenated. So not, you're, you're essentially feeding these microorganisms oxygen in order for them to convert your poop into their poop, uh, which is better poop. Um, so they call this biochemical oxygen demand. And it's the requirement of oxygen of these organisms so that they can survive to convert our waste into compost essentially. So we measure that oxygen uh, and it's called biochemical oxygen, oxygen demand. Uh, the second application here, environmental water monitoring, uh, ensuring that released water will not affect uh, the rivers or any water system's ability to sustain life. Hello, St. Lawrence River. Um, third application, boiler feed water deaeration. Uh, we talked about this before, making sure we don't have water or oxygen in our boiler feed water, which would corrode uh, our pipes. Installation, uh, sensors can be installed directly in the process. We're in a bypass stream. It is important to have a provision for removing them for maintenance. And again, use uh, a side tap center third of the pipe, ideally. Uh, and here you have a bypass fast loop kind of mechanism going uh, across a differential pressure generating device. Uh, in this case, it's a pump. But again, it could be an orifice. It could be a valve, uh, just something that makes a high pressure uh, here and the low pressure here so we can get some flow going through this smaller uh, loop on the side. Special application here, gas detectors. So our personal gas monitors uh, also have uh, oxygen detectors in them. Uh, they are the same type of sensors, galvanic or polarographic, that we have discussed earlier, just in a much smaller form. Objective four, uh, describing the operation of DO analyzers or AKA calibration and maintenance. A uh, couple of uh, methods here uh, for calibration, um, very non-scientific to be honest. Uh, I'll read off here what they do in the ILM and then I'll tell you what I did in real life. Uh, so the calibration methods, uh, first is 0% saturation. Uh, so to get your zero oxygen value, you use a sodium sulfate, which is a salt, as you'll notice, that de depletes oxygen, as we learned earlier. Uh, uh, saltier water has less oxygen. That's why we use a salt to make a zero atmosphere. Uh, and basically, um, you have a solution of uh, this salt solution in a, in a tube, and you lower your uh, sensor into it, and you're creating that atmosphere to zero your sensor. Uh, the other calibration you can do is 100% oxygen, where you use the same calibration chamber to simulate 100% uh, oxygen. And basically, all you do here is you take uh, water and uh, shake the crap out of it so that you can introduce as much air as you can. And then you put the sensor in there, and it's got atmospheric oxygen, 20.9% oxygen. That's the most it could theoretically have uh, in a container. So. Uh, that's what we use to calibrate. So that's 100% saturation. Plug it into that container and yeehaw, everything is good. 
uh, using a reference instrument uh, to compare. I'm not sure what this symbol came here from. Uh, doesn't matter, but basically this is taking a handheld uh, oxygen measuring device out there and you're throwing it in the pond uh, next to the other sensor and hopefully you're getting uh, the same readings. Um, now I'll tell you what we do in real life uh, or what we did do at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the way that these were installed at the wastewater treatment plant, I don't know if we discussed that, uh, not like this, but um, the sensor heads here we're mounted in a orange floating buoy, okay? And the, the face of the sensor was on the, on the face of the ball and the buoy floated on top of the water and the sensor was pointing straight down. So it was, the sensor would be right here on the water and it was connected to a long piece of uh, two inch aluminum pipe that was hinged so it would go up and down with the water, um, long story short. So the process generally around the wastewater treatment plant was every week you'd have to go, uh, lean on the rod, pull it out of the water, swing it over the deck, wipe it off with some paper towel, and then uh, calibrate it. The way we calibrated it was quite simple. While it was sitting on the deck, uh, it was in air, which is 20.9% oxygen. So you left it on the deck, you ran to the transmitter, you hit set 20 milliamps, and it was calibrated. You threw it back in the water, and that was kind of the drill. Uh, I don't know if that's a standard across uh, all sites, but that's the way it was done at the wastewater plant. That's the way I was shown. That's the way I did it. Okay, uh, so I had to get that out of the way. Uh, you pay for that in the classroom. Uh, you don't normally get it online. I just wanted to make sure I included that. Okay, maintenance. Again, I described it already. Memory and cleaning or replacement. Uh, electrolyte replacement. Again, you may or may not do that. Um, you won't have to do that if you're uh, SOP is to just replace the cells. Um, we had some cells that you could replace the, replace the electrolyte on. We did end up replacing them uh, with uh, sensors that just had replaceable cells. So that's probably the uh, state of the union as we talk today. That is uh, the end of liquid analyzers part C. So um, you are now prepared to write the liquid analyzer uh, exam, I believe. Yes, you are. So, congratulations. Getting close to the end here now. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you.